Hi there. I'm Simon St. Lawrence, Senior Editor at O'Reilly Media. I'm here with Ken Lundy. He's on the type development team at Adobe. 20 years ago, he wrote his first book for us, Understanding Japanese Information Processing. We're here to celebrate that and the, the directions it's gone since as CJKV Information Processing. So how did you get started on this? Uh, it's actually a pretty long story. Um, <laughs> I think it got started because I uh, developed an interest in uh, the Japanese language, which then transitioned into an interest in the writing system, which then transitioned into an interest in how the writing system is represented on computers. So uh, one of the first things I did was to develop an online file, which I called japan.inf, mm -hmm. which I maintained for several years that included details about how um, Japanese characters are encoded um, on computers, what the character sets are, um, and that eventually is what morphed into this 470-page uh, book that was published uh, 20 years ago this month. I remember seeing the, the Wired blip on the book. Uh, I was, you know, this thing was the second year of Wired. It was, it was new. It was exciting to see the, that people were interested in Japanese and that we could now cover multiple languages. What kind of a response did the book get? And in particular, did it get similar responses in Japan as it did elsewhere? Well, it, it's, uh, some people called it trailblazing, uh, mainly because there was no book like it before. Um, so it, it provided, you know, people with, you know, resources that they did not have before, which I think enabled a lot, a lot of companies to enter the Japanese market, um, because it provided the basics that they needed. Um, uh, my wife, um, who's Japanese, uh, we actually, we, uh, we married, uh, like six years after the book was published, but, um, she told me that, um, my book, um, somewhat made the Japanese embarrassed because somebody who is non-Japanese is the one who wrote this book about Japanese. And, uh, you know, that, that can be seen as a compliment. Well, five years later, you, you expanded the book. You went to a CJKV, so Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese approach. Um, mm -hmm. how, how was that transition? It's a lot of similar questions, but different specifics, it seems like. Uh, if you go through the first book, the 20-year-old one, um, I did include uh, some details about uh, Chinese and Korean, mainly about it was limited to character sets and encodings. Um, but the number of pages that that covered could be probably counted on one or two hands. So it was very limited. So um, the, uh, the next book, CJK, the Information Processing, that is really, you can kind of think of that as a, as a second edition to the first book. And the, the main thing I did there was to extend it and, um, you know, mainly update it because things happened in Japan since the book came out. And I also added significant amounts of Chinese and Korean information. So that, that's why it more than doubled in size. Yes, it definitely grew. It, it kind of had to. Um, I remember we had some early conversations about the second edition of CJKV, and that seemed also like a like a fairly significant shift. Uh, we left the... There we go. We've got the, the comparison. Yeah. Um, You've, you've been tracking this for 20 years, and over time, things seem to keep moving. I know that we kept the first edition of CJKV available as a PDF for people uh, because you dropped some things that might still be relevant to people dealing with older systems. Um, you know, how much change and how much continuity has there been? Well, I think the, the major change that happened uh, between the first and second edition of CJKV Information Processing was that um, Unicode became the de facto way in which um, uh, text is uh, handled on computers. And that's a good thing. So uh, one of the major things that I did in second edition um, was to add significantly more information about Unicode. And in some cases, I put the Unicode information up front and the legacy information behind it to stress the importance of the Unicode aspects. Well, on the Unicode, we, we seem to have a lot of developers who think that 
they've internationalized their program because they're using code that can handle Unicode. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously much more to that story. And I, I guess you're, you're in pretty much the place where it matters, where the details matter, where you have to go beyond just the, I can handle UTF-16. Yeah, there's much more to Unicode than simply handling the encoding. Um, the most important aspect of Unicode that um, a lot of developers um, neglect um, or don't handle correctly are the properties. That um, there's several different properties in Unicode, and these apply to different, you know, different characters in different ways. And um, Unicode, the Unicode Consortium, um, they provide the, the property files that developers can use so that the, the characters are treated correctly. This could be for line layout. It could be for you know, other purposes. Uh, sorting, for example. Sorting seems to give people special headaches. I, I remember all the work we did on you know, bubble sort and ASCII, and people are mm -hmm. suddenly surprised when it doesn't work the same way across a much larger, uh, more diverse range of characters. Mm -hmm. So, um, I had a lot of I want requests for your book uh, from XML people who I think were mm -hmm. maybe especially enthusiastic about Unicode and especially interested in the challenges of making different character sets work. But what kinds of audiences have you found with the book? Um, and, you know, one of the things that I keep asking myself around anything international is, are there more audiences who should be looking at this? Um, I mean, one, one big audience for the book is, uh, I, I think, our, our font developers. Um, I mean, that's, that's my background here at Adobe um, Font Development. So that explains why the chapters on font formats and typography exceed 100 pages each. Because mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of detail in there. In fact, there, there's a lot more to those topics than I convey um, in those chapters. Um, so it appeals to those people. Um, it appeals to, I think, any application developer who wants to um, market their product in these in these regions, because you know beyond Unicode, beyond the, the the character sets and encodings, there's other you know things you need to worry about. You also did the typography on this on all three books, mm -hmm. and that seems like its own special challenge. Now, even the fonts seem more difficult to find in this, although you're perfectly well positioned to to address that. Um, how far did you have to push to make this work? Have the tools gotten easier to deal with? Uh, what What was your experience in making this work? Well, the uh, I've actually typeset uh, four books, so the three that I wrote, and um, back in late the late nineteen eighties, early nineteen ninety, um, I did typeset a book back in Wisconsin. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, three professors wrote this book, and I typeset it using um, an ancient version of PageMaker. That's the best way to describe it. Um, and that experience primed uh, you? What's it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gave me a lot of... Um, what? It told me what I needed to do. <laughs> um but uh, when it came time to uh, typeset the books that I wrote, um, each time the proverbial rug was pulled from underneath me. I would say the first time was good. Um, when I first uh, you know, wrote Understanding Japanese Information Processing, I was using, I believe, PageMaker version 4, the Japanese version. I was doing this on a Macintosh SE with a very small screen. And somehow I was able to... Um, do the book that way. Um, I did want to use FrameMaker at the time, but um, it, the Japanese version was not available for um, Macintosh, so I couldn't. So when um, the next book came out, CJK, the Information Processing, um, this is actually after Adobe bought Frame, I was able to get a, uh, a version of FrameMaker on Mac um, that uh, handled Japanese. So I was able to, you know, completely typeset the book, including uh, the the index, which was generated by markers, using FrameMaker. But then Adobe discontinued FrameMaker on Macintosh. At least we didn't move it over to OS X. Um, so I had to then use uh, Adobe InDesign, and I used uh, CS3, the Japanese version, 
and I definitely pushed it to the limits because uh, the you know people who teach uh, in design they tell you don't have very large chapters in terms of numbers of pages and I had I think I have uh, four chapters that exceed 100 pages so I was definitely pushing InDesign to uh, very various limits, um, not just in, in the number of pages, but um, also when it came time to do the index. Mm -hmm. You know, interesting limitations there. But you know, keep in mind that I was using uh, CS3, and the the current version now is uh, the the CC version, the Creative Cloud, which is uh, you can think of that as CS7 because it came after CS6. Right. It's it's had time to mature. How are the fonts as you were doing that? And have, I'm assuming that it continues to improve and grow. Yeah, the, the, the font situation definitely um, improved. Back when I did the original book, um, the formats were limited um, in terms of what I can do. The tools also were limited. And uh, after, I think either right before or right after the, um, the second book was done, OpenType was announced by uh, Microsoft and Adobe jointly. And um, I think both the open type format and the tools that we you know, that we developed for making open type fonts, um, I think helped the situation so that if I needed to do a custom font, um, it was it it became a trivial act. And I think part of that is simply because you know this is my this is my specialty, so I know how to uh, wield the tools correctly. Yeah, to most. Do that one. Most of us don't have font superpowers. At one point, I thought I was going to have to create a bunch of characters to fill in for a book on Unicode, but I escaped. Um, yeah. I guess sort of a broad question. So the the second edition came out in 2008, so it's been five years. I, th I think it's holding up really well. Um, I was talking to somebody who was still using it six months ago, and they were pleased with it. But what kinds of things have changed in that that last five years, what kinds of things excite you that that seem new and different? Well, um, I guess one one big thing is that Unicode is growing. It's a it's a living and breathing standard, which is a good thing. Um, so the the character repertoire is larger than when um, the you know my latest book came out, um, and various things within Unicode um, have changed, and other standards have come out. I think you know some of the notable things that um, have have happened is uh, the use of variation sequences for East Asian languages um, have made things better because you know, characters or you know, versions of characters that would otherwise be considered unencoded can now be represented in Unicode using these sequences. Uh, another thing that has happened is, you probably heard the word emoji. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Yeah, the, which are um, uh, used uh, very heavily in Japan those are now in Unicode, and there's also work underway to um, support colored and animated glyphs in fonts. Fonts are monochrome. Yeah, the, the animations will be a challenge in print, but we'll yeah, have to but, see. Yeah, there's, there's actually proposals um, in the works to do that in fonts, which is a good thing. And then um, another issue that's uh, related to fonts that has happened since the book came out was... Um, uh, I think the best way to describe this is um, all modern font formats have a uh, limitation in the number of glyphs that they can include, which is 64K. So it's 65,536 mm -hmm. glyphs can be in a font. They, the, the actual number is slightly smaller than that because of you know some te technicalities. But the important thing is you're looking at about 65,000 glyphs. But um, Unicode right now has over 100,000 characters, meaning that it is not possible to um, create a single font resource that has a single glyph for all of Unicode. So uh, work began, I believe, in 2009, 2010, to define an XML format that would effectively be a, uh, a composite font that would reference uh, more than one font resource and uh, so this this virtual font could then, um, you know, be uh, can then handle all of Unicode, or you know, or a, a portion of Unicode that would otherwise not be possible to represent in a single font resource. That standard that it became an ISO standard, which was uh, then released in early 2012, less than a year ago. And I I did uh, 
you know, postulate about, you know, this topic um, in the book. So it's nice that, you know, something, you know, a standard, you know, resulted, you know, from that. Yeah, sometimes we can suggest things and they actually happen and, and it's great to see. Um, well, wonderful. Well, congratulations on the 20 years. I think it's been an extremely fruitful 20 years for this field and for those books. And I hope we'll get to see more of you soon. Great. Thank you very much.